My name is Gilda Jackson, and I sit in front of the fire once a day and read a chapter or two of some wonderful old book to anyone who might like to join me. Uh, I call it Fireside Reading, and I started it because of the pandemic. Um, I'd had the idea beforehand, and it seemed like a good idea, and so I I was, uh, I was moved to start because of the pandemic, and I'm very glad that I did. And now we've been doing it for many months, since April of last year. And I'm so glad that uh, many of you have found it. It's also available on YouTube, the Fireside Reading channel. And uh, all the books we've read are up there. And we've got through quite a few, many books. And it's, I always find, rather satisfying to, uh, to read books and to read some great books too. So I'm very glad to do this with you every day at five, at Fireside Reading on Instagram. Or if you want, you can watch and listen at your own leisure on the YouTube channel. Currently, we are starting at the beginning-ish of the wonderful book, Moby Dick, which I'm enjoying reading to you a great deal. Welcome to a fireside reading of Moby Dick, Chapter 6, The Street. If I had been astonished at first catching a glimpse of so outlandish an individual as Queequeg circulating among the polite society of a civilized town, that astonishment soon departed upon taking my first daylight stroll through the streets of New Bedford. In thoroughfares nigh the docks, any considerable seaport will frequently offer to view the queerest-looking nondescripts from foreign parts. Even in Broadway and Chestnut Streets, Mediterranean mariners will sometimes jostle the affrighted ladies. Regent Street is not unknown to Lascars and Malays, and at Bombay, in the Apollo Green, live Yankees have often scared the natives. But New Bedford beats all Water Street and Wapping. In these last-mentioned haunts, you see only sailors, but in New Bedford, actual cannibals stand chatting at street corners, savages outright, many of whom yet carry on their bones unholy flesh. It makes a stranger stare. But besides the Fijians, Tonga Tubors, Eromanagoans, Panangians, and Brigangians, and besides the wild specimens of the whaling craft which unheeded reel about the streets, you will see other sights still more curious, certainly more comical. There weekly arrive in this town scores of green Vermonters and New Hampshiremen, all athirst for gain and glory in the fishery. They are mostly young, of stalwart frames, fellows who felled forests and now seek to drop the axe and snatch the whale lance. Many are as green as the green mountains whence they came. In some things you would think them but a few hours old. Look there. That chap strutting around the corner. He wears a beaver hat and swallow-tailed coat, girdled with a sailor belt and sheath knife. Here comes another with a sou'wester and a bombazine cloak. No town-bred dandy will compare with a country-bred one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that in the dog days will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Now, when a country dandy like this takes it into his head to make a distinguished reputation and joins the great whale fishery, you should see the comical things he does upon reaching the seaport. 
In bespeaking his sea outfit, he orders bell buttons to his waistcoats, straps to his canvas trousers. Ah, poor Hayseed, how bitterly will burst those straps in the first howling gale when thou art driven, straps, buttons, and all, down the throat of the tempest. But think not that this famous town has only harpooners, cannibals, and bumpkins to show her visitors. Not at all. Still, New Bedford is a queer place. Had it not been for us whalemen, that tract of land would this day perhaps have been in as howling condition as the coast of Labrador. As it is, parts of her back country are enough to frighten one. They look so bony. The town itself is perhaps the dearest place to live in in all New England. It is a land of oil, true, but not like Canaan, a land also of corn and wine. The streets do not run with milk, nor in the springtime do they pave them with fresh eggs, yet in spite of this, nowhere in all America will you find more patrician-like houses, parks and gardens more opulent than in New Bedford. Whence came they? How planted upon this once scoria of a country? Go and gaze upon the iron emblematical harpoons round yonder lofty mansion, and your question will be answered. Yes, all these brave houses and flowery gardens came from the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans. One and all, they were harpooned and dragged up hither from the bottom of the sea. Can Herr Alexander perform a feat like that? In New Bedford, fathers, they say, give whales for dowers to their daughters and portion off their nieces with a few porpoises apiece. You must go to New Bedford to see a brilliant wedding, for they say they have reservoirs of oil in every house, and every night recklessly burn their lengths in spermaceti candles. In summertime, the town is sweet to see, full of fine maples, long avenues of green and gold, and in August, high in air, the beautiful and bountiful horse chestnuts, candelabra-wise, proffer the passer-by their tapering upright cones of congregated blossoms. So omnipotent is art, which in many a district of New Bedford has superinduced bright terraces of flowers upon the barren refuse rocks thrown aside at creation's final day. And the women of New Bedford they bloom like their own red roses. But roses only bloom in summer, whereas the fine carnation of their cheeks is perennial as sunlight in the seventh heavens. Elsewhere match that bloom of theirs ye cannot, save in Salem, where they tell me the young girls breathe such musk their sailor sweethearts smell them miles offshore as though they were drawing nigh the odorous Moluccas instead of the Puritanic sands. Chapter 7. The Chapel In this same New Bedford, there stands a whaleman's chapel, and few are the moody fishermen, shortly bound for the Indian Ocean or Pacific, who failed to make a Sunday visit to the spot. I am sure that I did not. Returning from my first morning stroll, I again sallied out upon this special errand. The sky had changed from clear, sunny, cold to driving sleet and mist. 
Wrapping myself in my shaggy jacket of the cloth called bear skin, I fought my way against the stubborn storm. Entering, I found a small, scattered congregation of sailors and sailors' wives and widows. A muffled silence reigned, only broken at times by the shrieks of the storm. Each silent worshipper seemed purposely sitting apart from the other as if each silent grief were insular and incommunicable. The chaplain had not yet arrived, and there were these silent islands of men and women who sat steadfastly eyeing several marble tablets with black borders masoned into the wall on either side of the pulpit. Three of them ran something like the following, but I do not pretend to quote. Sacred to the memory of John Talbot, who, at the age of 18, was lost overboard near the Isle of Desolation off Patagonia, November 1st, 1836. This tablet is erect oh no. This tablet is erected to his memory by his sister. Sacred to the memory of Robert Long, Willis Ellery, Nathan Coleman, Walter Canny, Seth Macy, and Samuel Gleag, forming one of the boat's crew of the ship Eliza who were towed out of sight by a whale on the offshore ground in the Pacific, December 31st, 1839. This marble is here placed by their surviving shipmates. Sacred to the memory of the late Captain Ezekiel Hardy who in the bows of his boat was killed by a sperm whale on the coast of Japan, August 3rd, 1833. This tablet is erected to his memory by his widow. Shaking off the sleet from my ice-glazed hat and jacket, I seated myself near the door and turning sideways, was surprised to see Queequeg near me. Affected by the solemnity of the scene, there was a wondering gaze of incredulous curiosity in his countenance. This savage was the only person present who seemed to notice my entrance, because he was the only one who could not read, and therefore was not reading those frigid inscriptions on the wall. Whether any of the relatives of the seamen whose names appeared there were now among the congregation, I knew not. But so many are the unrecorded accidents of the fishery, and so plainly did several women present, did several women present wear the countenance, if not the trappings of some unceasing grief, that I feel sure that here before me were assembled those in whose unhealing hearts the sight of those bleak tablets sympathetically caused the old wounds to bleed afresh. O ye whose dead lie buried beneath the green grass, who standing among flowers can say, Here, here lies my beloved Ye know not the desolation that broods in bosoms like these. What bitter blanks in those black-bordered marbles which cover no ashes. What despair in those immovable inscriptions. What deadly voids and unbidden infidelities in the lines that seem to gnaw upon all faith and refuse resurrections to the beings who have placelessly perished without a grave, as well might those tablets stand in the cave of Elephanta 
as here. In what census of living creatures the dead of mankind are included? Why it is that a universal proverb says of them that they tell no tales, though containing more secrets than the Goodwin Sands? How it is that to his name, who yesterday departed for the other world, we prefix so significant and infidel a word, and yet do not thus entitle him, if he but embarks for the remotest Indies of this living earth, why the life insurance companies pay death forfeitures upon immortals, in what eternal unstirring paralysis and deadly hopeless trance yet lies antique Adam, who died sixty round centuries ago, how it is that we still refuse to be comforted for those who we nevertheless maintain are dwelling in unspeakable bliss. Why are the living so strive to hush all the dead? Wherefore but the rumour of a knocking in a tomb will terrify a whole city? All these things are not without their meaning. But faith, like a jackal, feeds upon the tombs, and even from these dead doubts she gathers her most vital hope. It needs scarcely to be told with what feelings, on the eve of a Nantucket voyage, I regarded those marble tablets, and by the murky light of that darkened, doleful day, read the fate of the whaleman who had gone before me. Yes, Ishmael, the same fate may be thine. But somehow, I grew merry again. Delightful inducements to embark, fine chance for promotion, it seems. I, a stove boat, will make me an immortal by brevet. Yes, there is death in this business of whaling, a speechlessly quick, chaotic bundling of a man into eternity, but what then? Methinks we have hugely mistaken this matter of life and death. Methinks that what they call my shadow here on earth is my true substance. Methinks that in looking at things spiritual, we are too much like oysters observing the sun through the water and thinking that thick water the thinnest of air. Methinks my body is but the lees of my better being. In fact, take my body who will take it, I say. It's not me. And therefore, three cheers for Nantucket, and come a stove boat and stove body when they will, for stave my soul, Jove himself cannot. Thanks for joining me. More tomorrow, same time and place, five. Pacific at Fireside Reading on Instagram. All the chapters uploaded to the YouTube channel Fireside Reading. But until I see you next, I hope you stay very, very well. Good night.